So in 8.1, we explored the graphs of the sine and the cosine. Um, in 8.2, we're going to look at the other trig functions. So we're going to look at the tangent, the cotangent, the secant, and the cosecant. I'm going to break this into two parts. In part one, we're going to deal with the tangent and the cotangent. What does it look like? How, how do those graphs look? And um, you know, what's a good way to approach them? Uh, and then in 8.2 part two, we'll deal with the secant and the cosecant. So I'm going to kind of break this into two parts. So in the first part here, I would like to talk about the tangent and the cotangent. So let's start with our tangent function. Now, uh, when we were doing the sine and the cosine, I told you there were five x's that you want to concentrate on. The five x's for the tangent are going to be the same, but they're a little bit limited as to what information they give us. But we're still going to use 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Now think about as you travel around the unit circle, that, those are just the quadrantal angles. 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. So that's 0, 90, 180, 270, and 360. Okay. Now, the thing that you want to concentrate on mostly is the fact that we know that tangent is sine over cosine. Since we already know the graphs of the sine and the cosine, by focusing where the tangent is sine over cosine, it's going to help us. Now, here's where it gets a little weird. Every place that the sine is zero, the tangent will also be zero, since it's on the top of our fraction. So let's go down here, and here's our sine graph. Let's focus on the sine graph, and I'm going to just make a little dot every place that our sine is zero. So every place that our sine is zero, our tangent will also be zero. So let's put those zeros on the graph. So there's going to be a zero at negative 2 pi, at negative pi, at zero, at pi, and at 2 pi. So all of the full pi's, we are going to hit zero for our tangent function. Now, Every place that the cosine is zero, that's going to put the, a zero in the denominator. So now let's look at where the cosine graph hits zero. And so those are at the half pi, negative three halves, negative one half pi, positive one half pi, uh, one and a half pi, so at the half pi. So if we have a number over zero, that's an undefined spot. In a graph, an undefined spot will be an asymptote. So there's an asymptote here at the negative uh, pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 and negative 3 pi over 2. The asymptotes are evenly spaced apart. The zeros are evenly spaced apart. There is perfect, lovely, wonderful symmetry of the graphs. So technically, that's all that those five points, 0 pi over 2 pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi are going to give us. So it's going to go 0 asymptote, which I'll designate as an undefined symbol, 0 asymptote 0. It doesn't give us anything else. Now let's just analyze for a minute what else we need to know. If we stuck in pi over 4, now we don't need to because we'll start to know this pattern. Pi over 4 is 45 degrees. The tangent of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2 divided by square root of 2 over 2, or it's going to be equal to 1. So pi over 4 is right here, this point right here. We are technically at a height of 1. At negative pi over 4, we are at negative 1 because the um, sine would be negative and the cosine would be positive. Same square root of 2 over 2 um, in both, so you get negative 1. So what we get is we get these very narrow, skinny, kind of cubic-looking graphs. So we end up actually getting something that very much looks like a cubic. And then the same thing, because as we flip around the unit circle, it's going to do it again, up one to the right, down one to the left, 
up one to the right, down one to the left. These patterns continue, and the tangent keeps making these uh, cubics um, forever and ever and ever. And so it, you'll see a little cubic and an asymptote, and then a cubic and then an asymptote. And they're always equally spaced apart. Whatever one is doing, then it is going to repeat inside the asymptotes, inside the asymptotes, and that is going to repeat forever and ever and ever to the left and to the right because we can just keep looping around the unit circle. Do you need to know the pi over 4? Not really. I mean, if you know that it looks like a cubic and it's going to go up to the right and down to the left, that's going to be helpful. I'll show you what to look at. But remember, every place that the sine is 0, the tangent is 0. Every place that the cosine is 0, the tangent is undefined. So, the pattern you want to have memorized for a tangent is that it starts with zero, goes zero, asymptote, zero, asymptote, zero. So those are the five that you want to have memorized. If you have those memorized, the rest will fall into place. Okay? So that is what the graph of a tangent is going to look like. So where our sine and cosine were these lovely waves, the tangent has these spots that are undefined because it's a fraction. You get that zero in the denominator, it's going to mess things up. Okay? So there's the tangent function. So let's just kind of look at some of the properties. The domain is all real numbers except for a multiple of pi over 2, um, an odd pi over 2, so 1 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2. That's what this little thing does. It adds every 180 degrees. So that's what that domain says. I'm going to get a little bigger there for you. The range is all real numbers because think about it. It stretches up as high as we want and stretches down as low as we want. It doesn't skip any values in between. The x-intercepts, those are the zeros of sine are the pi's, the full pi's, 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, negative 1 pi, negative 2 pi. The only uh, y-intercept is 0. It hits exactly at 0, 0. The asymptotes line up with the domain, where the domain doesn't work at the pi over 2's, the odd pi over 2's, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2. There is going to be an asymptote. The tangent is an odd function. We could put a push pin here at the center flip it 180 degrees, and it would look just like we started. So it's technically an odd function. What does that mean algebraically? Well, if we took the tangent of negative x, that is the same as the negative tangent of x. So an odd function, if you have a negative inside it, that's the same as pulling the negative out in front. Even functions, a negative inside it doesn't do anything. It just goes away. But an odd function, it's like you multiply by negative. So that is a rule about tangent that's always going to be there. So those are some of the properties of the tangent function. One thing that uh, please make sure that you write down is this little fact right here. The period of a tangent function is pi. Let's think about it for just a minute. When we go through the unit circle, the sine and the cosine repeat. It takes one loop around before it repeats, before that wave repeats. The tangent, the first two quadrants, give you one of the cubics. And then the second two quadrants give you the other. So, so you get two loops around, which is unusual, but that's what a tangent, it actually repeats every 180 degrees and instead of every two, uh, 360, two pi's. Okay. So those are some of the properties about our tangent function. So let's practice graphing some tangents. So if something is on the inside that is touching the x's, it's going to change the x's, just like in the sign. So this is going to change our x's. This is going to change our y's. 
Now, let's write down the parent. So the parent, remember, goes for a tangent. Zero is at zero. Pi over two is undefined. It's an asymptote. Pi is at zero. Three pi over two is an asymptote. Two pi is back to zero again. And then, of course, we have those cubics in between. But we have some things that have changed. So, take what's in parentheses, set it equal to the 5 original to find your 5. So we're going to set x over 2 equal to 0, x over 2 equal to pi over 2, and we can keep going. So you set always what's in the parentheses, even for a sine and a cosine, you set what's in the parentheses equal to the 5 original and solve. Well, each time, what's happening? Well, we're dividing on the left side to get rid of that division by 2. We're just going to do algebra multiply both sides by 2. So here we get 0. Uh, here we get 2 pi over 2, which reduces down to pi. And then you'll notice every time we're going to end up multiplying by 2. So when x over 2 equals pi, we get 2 pi. And you can already see the pattern. It's counting now by pi's. So 0, pi, 2 pi. The next one's going to be 3 pi. The last one's going to be 4 pi. Remember, they are evenly spaced. So if you find the spacing, you can just count by that spacing. They're always evenly spaced. Now we've got to find out where did the zeros or the asymptotes go. Well, 2 times 0 is still 0. So there's still an asymptote, or 0 in the first one, an asymptote in the next one, 0, asymptote, 0. What does the 2 do? Well, at the 45 degree mark for the original, you know we're up at 1, and then at negative 45, we're down at negative 1. The 2 just stretches it up 2 and down 2. So now, instead of 45, actually halfway in between, we're going to be up 2 and then down 2, but I'll show you. So, I'm going to make, um, let's go every uh, two, let's make this a pi. We could have probably even stretched it out even more. I'm going to make that pi 1. So when I graph these, one of the first things I do is I put on the um, asymptotes. So there is an asymptote at pi. There is an asymptote at 3 pi. So there's going to be an asymptote at 5. Stretch that out on your graph paper. They are always equal distant apart. So if we go to the left, there's going to be 1 at negative pi, at negative 3 pi, at negative 5 pi, at negative 7 pi. After I put on my asymptotes, then I put on my zeros, which are always halfway between the asymptotes. Zero, 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 zero. Now I have to put on the two. Well, the two is going to be halfway in between here. So halfway in the, between there, we're going to be up at two. So we're going to be way up here. And halfway to the left, we're going to be down. I guess I didn't need to stretch the two up so much, but you can. And we should look like a little cubic. And make your cubics repeat themselves. So this is going to be up to. This is going to be down to. This is going to be up to. This is going to be down to. Why two? Because it's almost like... It's not really an amplitude because that's what we call it for sine and cosine, but it's a stretch. 
instead of going up one and down one, it's really gone up two and down. Those repeat again and again and again and again and again. So let's look what happened. The inside always affects the x's. So the x over 2 made us multiply all the original x's by 2. So that's why they became 0 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4. The pattern of the zeros and the asymptotes are not going to change. Now, if we added something on the outside, you do have to add that to zero. But an asymptote plus something is still an asymptote. So the asymptotes really don't get changed. So there's our first example. Let's do another one. So this graph has a few different things that have changed about it. This always affects our x. These things will affect our y. This always affects our x. These things always affect our y. So let's break down the original. Here's our pattern. 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Always goes for a tangent. 0 undefined, 0 undefined. Zero. Okay. So what do you want to do? You want to take whatever's in parentheses and you want to set it equal to the original 5. So x minus pi equals 0. Well, what do we do? To solve that, we have to set uh, or add pi to both sides. So we get x equal. So our new function starts out at pi. And then we're going to do x minus pi equals the next x, pi over 2. Well, if we add a pi to a pi over 2, if I have one pizza pie and I have a half a pizza pie, I have three halves. So three pi over 2. That's the next x. And the x minus pi equals pi. If I add a pi to a pi, I have two pi's. And you can see it's kind of counting by half pi's. And so if you kept doing this pattern, the next one would be 5 pi over 2. And the last one would be 3 pi. So those are our new five x's. So this changes our x's, these change our y's. Well, the zero asymptote, zero asymptote, zero is kind of there. If I take negative two times zero, it's still zero. But when I minus one, it will change it. So all the zeros turn into negative ones. The asymptotes are still asymptotes. All the zeros turn into negative ones because we're going to subtract one from the zero because it would be negative 2 times 0 is 0, minus 1 is minus 1. Okay. Now, we do have to account for what the negative 2 does. For a tangent, the 45s, or halfway between zeros and the asymptotes, goes up 1, down 1 to make that thing. But now the negative 2, the negative flips it, and the 2 stretches it out. So it's going to flip and stretch, okay? But I'll show you as we go. So let me, um, okay, so we need to go from pi to 3 pi, okay. So, um, let's go pi. So I'm counting every two, and then that's a half a pi. So four makes a pi. Right? Sorry, my graph paper's a little weird, but okay. So let's make, let's count every other one. That's one. The other ones were stretched. So at pi, we are at negative 1. Okay. 
And then at three pi over two, so halfway in between the pi and the two pi, one and a half, there's a mass. Two pi, we're also at negative one. And then at uh, five halves, or two and a half, we're at the maximum point. We're equal space. So once you see the spacing, just keep that kind of thing. So negative one, asymptote, asymptote, negative one, asymptote, negative one, asymptote. Once you have the asymptotes in the negative ones on your graph, you're pretty much ready to go. But we have to still account for this negative 2. Now, normally, for the next part of things, I would graph one up to the right and one down to the left, and I would make my sweeps. But we have this negative 2 there. So think about what is 1 times negative 2. It's negative 2. So instead of going 1 over um, and 1 up, we are going to now go um, halfway over and 2 down. So we have to go all the way down here to negative 3. And then on the left side, halfway over, we're going to go 2 up from this center dot. So over, halfway over and 2 up. 1, 2, 2, and end up right there. So the two flipped it and made the cubic stretch out a little bit and go the left side up and the right side down. So halfway between go from the center point, halfway between go two down, halfway between go two up. Start at the center, half of the chain, go two up on the left, two down on the right. And those like 45s are always halfway between. So wherever your asymptote and your center be. Okay, we just a few more to make. And I don't want to stop, I want to make these little pivots going up and down as far as my graph is left, within reason. Okay? So let's analyze what happened. The minus pi ended up adding a pi to every single one of my x's. So my graph really shifted to the right a pi. The minus one took our centers down to negative one. The negative two flipped it over and stretched it out a little bit. So that is example two. Now it said to graph one period of the function. I graphed more than that. Um, I want you to really stretch your graph out. Whatever your graph paper holds, make it fit that. Skip this one. We're not going to go backwards. I just want to practice going forward first. And then um, let's talk now about how the cotangent looks. Now the tangent and cotangent were named tangent cotangent because they are um, very similar functions as far as their graph goes. Sine and cosine look alike. Tangent and cotangent look alike. Secant and cosecant are going to look alike. So they were named actually based upon their graphs more than anything else. When we look at a cotangent, cotangent, we need to think about the fact that it is cosine over sine. So if we look at the original five x's, 0 pi over 2 pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, we need to know, well, what is its pattern of zeros and asymptotes? Well, since the cosine is on top this time, since the cosine is on top that time, every place that the cosine equals zero, let's put a dot, 
the cotangent will be zero over something. So it will also equal zero. So let's put our zeros, and this time the zeros are at the odd pi over twos. So one pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two, and the negatives are the versions. So at the pi over twos, we're gonna be at zero. So this is zero and this is zero. Now this time the sign is in our denominator, so it's gonna cause the asymptotes. So every place that our sign has a zero, which are at the pi's, every place the sign has a zero at the pi's, one pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, it is going to cause an asymptote in the graph. So there's gonna be an asymptote. So at all of the full pi's, one pi, two pi, negative one pi, negative two pi, there will be an asymptote. So the tangent goes zero, asymptote zero, asymptote zero. The cotangent goes the opposite, asymptote zero, asymptote zero, asymptote. It starts out with an asymptote. That causes it to be an even function. But what's very interesting, let's analyze for a minute. If we plug in pi over four, we're still going to get one the cotangent of pi over 4 is 1. So pi over 4 is here. So we're actually up at 1 on the left side. This is 3 pi over 4 right here. <coughs> the cotangent of 3 pi over 4 is actually negative 1. So this is kind of an interesting development. For a cotangent, the left side goes up and the right side goes down. So a lot of times we call, because the tangent and cotangent are reciprocals, we call the cotangent the flip of the tangent. When in many ways, even the graph reflects that, it looks like a flip. So we can do that again and again. Left, we go up one. Right, we go down one. Left, we go up one. Right, we go down one. That is the parent function. So if we put a negative in front of a cotangent, the negative in front of a cotangent will flip it over, make it look like a tangent. So it's kind of backwards, it's kind of weird. And it's just because of how we cycle through the unit circle. That the cotangent ends up going up on the left and down on the right. So that is what the parent function looks like. And that will help us develop what all the other ones look like based upon a cotangent. So let's go ahead and look at the properties real quick. This time, the domain and the asymptotes mentioned that every full pi, 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, there is an asymptote. There is a problem. So that's why the domain and the range look like that. Or, I'm sorry, the domain and the asymptotes look like that. They mention the n pi's, 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. The range is still all real numbers. This time the intercepts are at the odd half pi, so 1 half pi, 3 halves, 5 halves, 7 halves. This one never hits the y-axis, or, uh, yeah, the, it doesn't have a y-intercept because of the fact that there is an asymptote there. We consider it still an odd function. I'm sorry, it is an odd function because if we put a push pin here and turned it, it actually does the same thing as a tangent. It's just odd in, in an odd way. We, we, when you see this, this point here is down here. And so you can think about as it flips, where does it flip to? Just like our tangent function, Make sure that you note that the period is a pi. So it now it only takes a pi before the cycle repeats itself. Sine and cosine, we know the period is two pi. Tangent and cotangent is a pi before it recycles through. So let's actually look at graphing a cotangent function. So 
So let's look at our parent. I'm going to write down the parent. And it is your job to know that they go up to the left and down to the right. The parent goes 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 3 pi for the x's. The y's for a cotangent go asymptote 0, asymptote 0, asymptote 0. Now, we have this 4x here. The 4x is going to change our x's. Anything in the parentheses touching the x's affects the x's. Anything on the outside affects the y's. So our new function, the x's are going to go, where does 4x equal 0? Well, it's 0. Where does 4x equal pi over 2? Well, we would divide by off the 4, divide by 4, and that would be pi over 8. So just think about that 4 is going to cross over and multiply by the 2. So that's pi over 8. Where does 4x equal pi? Well, the 4 is going to cross over. That's going to be pi over 4. And, you know, think about the distance between 0 and pi over 8 is pi over 8. We're counting by pi over 8. So the next one is going to be 3 pi over 8. And the last one is going to be, it would be 2 pi over 4, which is pi over 2. Think about the period for just a minute. Um, normally, the period is pi, 4x equals pi when x equals pi over 4. So at this point right here, it is already cycled through an asymptote of 0 and an asymptote. Okay, so it's still going to go in that period. The 3 is not going to change. Multiplication of 0 and asymptotes times 3 is still that same, same thing. So it's going to go um, asymptote 0, asymptote 0, asymptote. What's it going to change? Well, that halfway points get multiplied by 3. So we're going to go 3 up on the left side and 3 down on the right side. Okay, so let's count by pi over 8. One, wait, let's see here. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I think we can do it better than that. Maybe we can stretch it out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There's a pi. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, eight, that's a negative. So I'm just counting by pi over eights. Divide pi into eight pieces. That's our common denominator for all of these. Okay, so let's put our asymptotes on. The asymptotes are always equally spaced. So if your graph paper isn't correct, or if you're not counting correctly, it shouldn't be equal spaced, and then you can find your error. We have an asymptote at zero. The next asymptote is pi over 4, a fourth of the way to pi, which is 2 eighths. So that would be here. And then the next asymptote is at the halfway point, which is here. And then there's an asymptote here. And there's an asymptote here. They are equally spaced. And then we can go backwards, count equally spaced backwards. So you can make your graph paper count by the units we want. Since our common denominator, the smallest denominator is 8, I just counted by 8s to get to a pi. Now let's put our zeros on. There's a 0 halfway in between. Now normally, a cotangent would go up one to the left and uh, down one to the right, up one, down one. But now that what the three does is it just makes it go up three, down three. So let's make this go one, two, three, and then we'll go down one, two, negative. Okay. So now on the left side, you're going to go up three. On the right side, you're going to go down three, exactly halfway in between. Up three to the left, 
down three on the right. Make a cubic descend that looks good. Up three on the left, down three on the right. Make your little cubic descent. You can just keep that pattern going. Up three on the left side, down three on the right. And I just keep doing that, fill up my grass. Sorry, my grass. So let's analyze what happened. The four squished it in and it changed the period so that one cycle happened in a pi over four. The three just stretched it out for the up three, down three version. Normally it goes up one, down one. So there is example. We're going to do one more example and then we're going to stop. So it says uh, let's graph one period of this cotangent function. Now we have a lot of stuff going on for this one. We have all of this stuff affecting our x's. This stuff is going to affect our y's. Okay. This is going to affect our x's. This is going to affect our y's. Okay. So I always write down the parent because that's my guy for everything I'm doing here. Zero is an asymptote. Pi over two is a zero. Pi is an asymptote. Three pi over two is a zero. Um, two pi is an asymptote. Oh. So again, remember, you take what's in parentheses, and we're going to set it equal to the five original x's. If you see the pattern ahead of time, we're allowed to stop. So you're going to ask yourself, where does 2x minus pi equal 0? Well, that's an algebraic expression we need to solve for x. So we're going to add pi to both sides, divide by 2. So our first asymptote occurs at pi over 2. Now let's do it again. We need to see what's the spacing. Can we find out what the spacing is? So you say, where does 2x minus pi equal pi over 2? Well, to solve for that, if you add a pi to a pi over 2, that's one whole pi with a half a pi is 3 halves, 3 pi over 2. This 2 is going to cross over and multiply by the 2 down there, so that's going to be 3 pi over 4. That's our next one. And we can set it equal, the next one is pi. If we set um, 2x minus pi equal to pi, we're going to get 2x equals 2 pi, so x equals pi. And we're technically adding a fourth of a pi every time. So if we do the next one, we're going to get um, uh, 5 pi over 4. And the next one will be um, 3 pi. And let's think about why. This is 2 fourths, 3 fourths, 4 fourths, 5 fourths, 6 fourths. So if you think we're counting by fourths, we technically. So it's just a matter of fractions and how fractions, if they mess with your brain at all. Now, asymptotes are going to stay asymptotes. 3 times an undefined value minus 1 is still an undefined value. So you can put the asymptotes back in. So the first one, the middle one, and the last one are still an asymptote. 
Now the zeros, we're going to do 3 times 0 minus 1. So that's going to be 0 minus 1. So all the zeros become negative 1. Now let's think about our pi over 4. That pi over 4 is usually 1 for a tangent and a cotangent. So 2x minus pi is equal to pi over 4. Where? Where's the, there, where's the 1 happening? Well, we get 2x equals uh, 5 pi over 4. Sorry about that. 5 pi over 4, which is 5 pi over 8. So 5 eighths, where the heck is that? 5 eighths. It's 0.625, so it's right here, right in there. Um, at that point, that would normally be 1. 3 times 1 is 3, 3 minus 1. That, the cotangent of that, 2 times that minus pi, is going to be 3 times 1 minus 1. It's 3 times 1 minus 1. Uh, 2. <laughs> So, okay, so let's put all this together. So I need to count by my lowest, or uh, my biggest denominator is a 4. So let's count by fourths. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, there's a pi. 1, 2, 3, 4, there's 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, there's negative pi. One, two, three, four, there's negative. And then I'm just going to count one, two, three. Okay. So always put your asymptotes on first. It's kind of the easiest thing to see. So we have an asymptote at a half of pi, which is right here. We have an asymptote at pi, and now we should be able to see the spacings very nice. The next asymptote is three halves, one and a half. So there's an asymptote at two pi, and we can keep going backwards and put in all our asymptotes. They are equally spaced. So we should be able to find that spacing. The center now is at negative 1. The reason the center is at negative 1 because I've dropped this function down 1. So now let's put all the negative 1s on. They're halfway in between the asymptotes. So negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. Now the 3 doesn't flip it. Our uh, cotangent function always looks like that. Left up, right down. Left up, right down. Left up, right down. All the 3 is going to do is going to stretch it up 3. So now, um, on the left side of this point, go halfway up and count up 3. 1, 2, 3. So we would get to this point right here. And then on the right side, count down 3. 1, 2, 3. So it's still going in its normal positive direction, it is a flipped cubic. But now it's going to go from center up 3, down 3. So from center, count up 3. And down three. Make it cubic. Up three. Down three from center. Make your cube. And so on. So the Asymptotes are equally spaced. The centers are always smack dab in the middle of the asymptotes. And then smack dab in the middle of those are the points that you see here.
there is an example of a point change. Okay. Now, the assignment we're going to start with, okay, if you go into Google Classroom, and if you find, it says uh, 8 to worksheet number 1, Worksheet number one is going to be a uh, tangent and cotangent and a cosine. Okay, I'm going to resend it right now. Do you see how the equations are missing? There's no equations there. Um, I'm going to resend it as a PDF and the equations will be there. But look for worksheet number one. That's going to be four tangent functions and oh, two tangents, two cotangents, four problems. Uh, we'll work on that in class. Um, tomorrow. <coughs>